My name is Justin Gage, and you're tuned in to the Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions Podcast with your host, Jason Woodbury. One Saturday, I took a walk to zip her head. I met a girl there, and she almost knocked me dead. Please look at me. What do you see that's travel around the world? Just you and me, punk rock girl. I tapped her on the shoulder and said, do you have a bow? smiled and said she did not know give me a chance let's go slam dance we'll dress like mini pearl just you and me punk rock girl we went to the walla on 11th and orange and ordered some hot tea the lady said well no we only have an oyster so we jumped up on the counter and shouted in our key. thanks so much for tuning in welcome to transmissions i'm jason woodbury Glad to have you here. How are you doing? I hope the answer is great. I'm joined this week on the show by drummer and comedian John Worcester. You might have seen Worcester on stage with bands like Super Chunk or the Bob Mould Band or the Mountain Goats, who've got an incredible new album out called Dark in Here, and they're heading out on the road. So hopefully you are vaxxed up and, uh, I don't know, ready to go out and see some live music. I am really looking forward to getting a chance to see the Mountain Goats. Uh, we talked a lot in this conversation about recording Dark in Here, as well as their uh, other recent album, Getting into Knives in the South. Worcester is also one half of the comedy duo Sharpling and Worcester. You can hear them every week on The Best Show, which streams at thebestshow.net. Every Tuesday night, they do three hours of comedy and music. Worcester and Sharpling embark on these incredible scripted phone calls in which Worcester plays all sorts of deranged and strange characters. Uh, we get into that and uh, and a lot more. Worcester's had a long life in independent rock and roots music, and it was great to get a chance to sit down with him, talk about his long history. And of course, he's a really funny guy, very sweet, very kind, and it was a, it was a really good time getting into it with him. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. I'll speak with you a little bit more on the other side. Thanks so much for tuning into Transmissions. Uh, I have been having so much fun making the show lately, and uh, hearing from you all absolutely makes me feel great and and really uh, bolstered. I love hearing what you all think about the show, so don't hesitate to get in touch. You can find me on Twitter. You can find my email address over at Aquarium Drunkard. So don't hesitate to drop a line. Let me know what you think of this talk or any of the others. Let me know what you'd like to hear more of, or uh, I guess even let me know if if there's something you'd like to hear a lot less of. (laughs) I don't mind. Anyway, let's head into the conversation. I'll speak with you a little bit more on the other side. Here's me and John Worcester. Thanks so much for tuning in to Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions. I'm really honored you're here. John, thanks so much for hopping on the line here with us on Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions. It's really great to have you. I'm a, I'm a big fan of your work and all of its many uh, facets. Well, thank you. It's been a long, uh, I hate to use the word journey, but it's been a long journey. <laughs> what a long, strange trip it's been. I think that's what you meant to say, right? <laughs> I, d- I did, yes, without uh, bringing up a, ba- a band I still don't understand after no lack of trying. You and your musical, <laughs> you and your your comedic partner Tom Sharpling, uh, holdouts when it comes to the dead. Not 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 yeah. getting on board. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's tough because John Darnell. I mean, he's a massive fan, and uh, I I have this with the band Kiss also, where I, I'm not a fan, but I want to know everything I can about the band about about <laughs> Kiss. The grateful that I'll buy any book, audio book. I I spent. I think I spent at least three weeks listening to this 15 CD audio book that this guy, David Brown did uh, a few years ago. And it's just, I, I need to know everything, even though I don't like the music. So wait, so, so of, David, David Brown, who did that awesome CSNY uh, bio. Am yes. I, and I listened to that in its entirety also. <laughs> Well, that I listened to that one, but I didn't realize he did a Kiss book. I probably will have to track that down. No, um, he did a Dead book. Oh, got it, got it, got yes. it. For a yes. second, I thought we were talking about Kiss because in my notes I wrote down <laughs> that there was a call. 
on the best show that cracked me up. Most of them do, but there was a call sort of semi recently, at least of the time that we're recording this, where you were do you were talking about if I remember it right, Kiss doing like an acoustic cruise or something like that, like a like a boat thing. And and, and you and Sharpling were talking about the uh how hearing the songs stripped down and performed acoustic really reveals the the song craft. And uh I think it's one of the funniest things. The only thing funnier to me than what you guys are actually saying was the fact that the two of you could hardly keep it together during that call, which I loved. Yeah, that's becoming more and more a uh, a thing, especially on my end. We went for, I feel like we went for 15 years without either of us laughing very much, and now we just laugh constantly. So it's almost <laughs> it's almost built in that that we're going to die laughing at some point. Yeah. Yeah. He told a story recently, uh, and that's sort of where I wanted to kind of start our conversation, is that he told a story on on Marin recently about how when you were growing up um, in Pittsburgh, you, you, the local the local rock station rebranded as like a like an alternative station, I think. Right. Well, uh, it's Philadelphia. Complete, complete brain slip. But so you were talking about growing up and and, and there was a, a DJ on the station who on the new station named Mohawk and uh yes. and it was the same guy that you had previously been listening to on the station right but you actually called and somehow yes. had a had a discussion about how this whole thing went over um uh my friend made the call but uh yeah basically there was this um long running top 40 station in Philadelphia um God, from when I was old enough to even listen to the radio until 1980, uh, it would have been 82, I think, um, WIFI, Top 40, that's all they played, and um, then <laughs> somewhere around 1982, this format was go- was kind of kind of seeping into America that was that was like a alternative rocks uh, kind of format. So we're talking you know, combat rock, um, ghost in the machine era police, um, that sort of thing. Nothing super hard. Every now and then you'd hear maybe, uh, TV party by black flag, that, but that, that was rare. So it's, you know, it, it was like the commercial alternative rock of the day. Yeah. And so, but this change just kind of happened overnight and they pretty much kept most of the of the staff. And so now this guy whose voice you heard, you know, spinning, whatever, Break My Stride by whoever that was. That, uh, was that Bertie Higgins? I'm not sure who, who it was. But like whatever, <laughs> Olivia Newton-John, physical, whatever, you know, playing that one day. And the next day they're playing, I don't know, uh, something by Ultravox. Yeah. And, uh, and so this guy said, all right, this is Mohawk and you're listening to something or other. And, and so my friend called in and just said, look, we know who you are. We know that you're the, you're the guy <laughs> from yesterday. And, uh, he goes, yeah, this, this new format. Oh my God. And, and he goes, are you into it? No, I'm, I mean, we're all looking for new jobs right now. It's, it's just stupid. We hate it. <laughs> <laughs> To me, it seems like that's om- that's almost like a bummer reverse American graffiti, right? Where you find the DJ, you know, blasting music out into the night, and instead of the mystery and the sort of romance of the whole thing, uh, it's just like the indignity of the of the pop culture or or music business, you know. And it seems like that it seems like that's such a that that's such a like a, a potent element in your comedy overall and and sort of you know the stuff that you've you've done i don't know if that tracks for you yeah i i think we always like to to show the i I don't know if dark side is the right phrase but but the the underbelly the the unspoken truth of of what goes on you know in in the music the tv the uh the film world when so so when the when the station flipped formats and they were playing stuff like like the police uh with the, and and the clash that was that was the stuff that you were you were pretty into right was was that some of the first stuff that made you want to play drums Oh yeah um I loved uh I I listened to to that station WIFI um when it was a top 40 station when I was a kid so th- that was my first exposure to music really was 
um, you know, the the hits of the early to mid seventies. And um, I still listen to a lot of that stuff. Um, but when I started playing drums, that that was around maybe 1979, 80. And I figured out I could play along with records with these kind of nice headphones that my parents had that were very padded. So they kind of blocked out, you know, the drums so you could hear the music and, and the drums at the same time. And um, the first record I ever played along with was this Graham Parker album called uh, Squeezing Out Sparks. So once I figured that out, I was playing along with all, all these records that I was really getting into that were kind of new at the time at Outlandos de Moore and Regatta de Blanc and eventually London Calling. Um, so those were the records that I really kind of learned to play drums to. Um, but it, it's interesting about this radio station. My memory is it only lasted in that format for maybe a year. And you could tell as time was going on that, oh yeah, it, they must have really terrible ratings because now I'm hearing Billie Jean twice an hour yeah, on yeah. this on this thing. So you'd hear, you'd still hear, maybe you'd hear uh, Holiday in Cam uh, uh, Cambodia, they would play. Wow. Amazingly. And, and then you'd hear Beat It or Billie Jean and and then something else that's that was equally as top 40. And then eventually it was just, it was top 40 again. Yeah. So it was you know, full, full circle, full circle. But, yeah. you, but you were playing yeah. along with with records that's something that you've kind of kept up right like uh, when I, I listened to a talk you did with with todd berry on his very funny podcast about playing along with stuff on spotify will you still kind of cue stuff up and i don't know if it's if it feels like rehearsal to you or practice but i mean essentially sort of play along with things like that and just put your head in those yeah. different mind mind you know sort of different frames maybe oh totally that that's you know, for a drummer, that's that's pretty much the only <laughs> the the only way I think. You know, uh, because you're yeah, you know, you're not writing songs, you're not singing, blah blah blah. So you're a, and it sucks to just play the drums by themselves. It's it's not fun, and it's it's right. you know you, you end up just like humming along with a song that you're playing along to in your mind. So why not just play along with the actual song? And um, that's pretty much all I do. I, I make these playlists, and I'll play along with whatever and i uh that was one good thing about the pandemic was that i i practiced a lot and i practiced a lot to to music that i really um hadn't really ever given a ton of time to like i love playing along with kind of classic reggae because it's so out of my wheelhouse and it's so you know for, for a drummer it's the exact opposite of what pop rock drumming is everything is reversed you know the it's it's on the on the one and three instead of the the two and four and and uh so it's um it just kind of makes you think in a different way and i'll i'll, I'll play along with very remedial jazz stuff you know i'm not a jazzer but i i really appreciate it and it's very impressive to me um so i'll just kind of like tap along with that stuff it just kind of makes you think differently and and i i bring a lot of that um, especially to the mountain goats when we make records. And um, um, I find that, that that practice and preparation really adds a lot to my input, specifically in the mountain goats. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I've been a, a, a big fan of John Darnielle's songwriting for a very long time at this point. Um, you know, I guess getting close to 20 years or something like that, that I've been listening to Mountain Goats, and obviously the Mountain Goats existed before that, but over the last, I mean, especially over the last, like, decade or so, watching, like, the uh, the Jordan Lake sessions recently, I, I was just, like, I was struck by the fact that everybody in the band seems like they are really dialed in right now and really interested in creating these really dynamic and like i feel so cheesy talking about it or, or or you know trying to articulate it but really like sophisticated arrangements and these really like i don't know there's just so much tasteful playing happening with the mountain goats and john singing in different ways and and really pushing himself melodically and i don't know it just seems like you guys all seem like you're having a really really good time and are maybe stretching out in a way that is uh 
is is a little bit different than what people might expect at this point from sort of a a legacy indie ra- indie act or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think um, for for us or or for for anyone that, that that's still doing it after all these years and trying to remain creative, that's what it's all about. It's all about ex- exploration and and learning new things and 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 kind of bringing all this new stuff that you're learning or, or, or even just trying to learn, even if you don't really have a grasp of it, it all, it sure. all kind of ends up in this pot together and it's exciting to, to get together and, Oh, Hey, I learned this and I learned this and we'll put it together. And, and it, it's, it's still the mountain goats, but it's a new, a new flavor. And um, a lot of that is down to Matt Douglas, who, who is our, our most recent addition and and he's just this incredible multi-instrumentalist and he brings so much to our sound now where um i feel like we can't help but have our game upped just by listening to him you know he adds so much and he's such a, a great player and but he's incredibly open to what we do he's by no means an indie rock guy i would be surprised if he was aware of 90 percent of the of of the kind of references that we throw out in the in the tour bus or the van and that's great though because he's kind of a blank slate in in that department and we're kind of blank slates in what he does right you know what i mean so 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 it all it all kind of we all learn from each other and that's what's so great about it. And you know, a lot of times you're in a band and you you all just kind of have a finite amount of what you do. You know, I can do this and that's pretty much it. And this is what we sound like. And there's nothing wrong with that. The Ramones are, you know, the greatest band of all time in a way. And, you know, they, they did one thing incredibly well. And um, but, you know, that that can get kind of uninteresting after a while and i feel like with the mountain goat specifically in in terms of my um i hate to use the word career but uh it it, uh it's the most it's the most creative super chunk is very creative too uh max an excellent excellent songwriter and and i try to to you know match what i think will be his uh the sound he's he's hearing in his head when he gives us these demos so um right um yeah so so it's uh yeah you just try to always keep bringing bringing new new things to what you do yeah well you've done so much you know in terms of in terms of that i was i was thinking about how well we'll, we'll come back to that in a second sorry uh yeah. what i was gonna say was um you know the uh, mountain goats get, getting into knives and dark in here those were both recorded in in Memphis, right? Um, Getting It In Nice was recorded at Sam Phillips Studio in Memphis, and then we went immediately to Muscle Shoals, Alabama, right? Uh, and and recorded Dark In Here at at Fame Recording, which is where you know a lot all that uh, classic um, all that classic stuff was. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. so that was was that before that was right before the pandemic pretty much. I, if if I if I have my timing right or or pretty close? Yeah. All, all the uh the news <laughs> the news was rolling in uh while we were starting in Memphis and then as those two weeks went on it, you know, you, you just found yourself you know, just in this constant state of like did I did I wash my hands that I Yeah. did I uh you know and, and and by the time we we're in Muscle Shoals, you know, it's a very small town. And so to be in this kind of small southern town while you're getting all this news about this world calamity situation, it, it was very, you know, it was it was very bizarre. It was very, you know, it was, it, it was a very interesting situation. And we got that record done. I think I flew home on March 18th. And, oh, and to me, that's that's the day it all kind of shut down for me anyway. So that that was the last that's still the last time I, I flew. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So so since then, you've mostly just been just hanging at home for the for the most part, I imagine. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a sick 
family members. So, so it's been, you know, it's been a lot of, a lot of staying ar- around the, the household. So that's, that's been nice to, uh, that's, yeah. that's another semi positive thing about this is that I'm not on the road. So I can help, I can help out. Well, well, looking back sort of in your, your CV, uh, you had recorded, correct me if I'm wrong, but you'd recorded at Sam Phillips before, right? I mean, pretty early on, uh, with your band, I don't know if the band was called the right profile at this point or if it was the Carnies, but you you had already worked at Sam Phillips at least. Is is that right? Yeah, that that was. Um, I, I joined. I um, try to be as brief with this as I can. I um, I grew up outside of Philadelphia and um, played kind of in you know what, what you would call like punk rock, whatever indie rock bands in the early and mid eighties. And uh, I ended up going down to Winston-Salem, North Carolina in uh, early 86 and auditioning for this roots rock band uh, called uh, The Right Profile. And um, one of the guys in the band has gone on to great success as, uh, as a writer. Stephen J. Dubner is his name. And he's a co-author of, of those Freakonomics books. Yeah. And, uh, and so... Uh, uh, I joined the band, I think, in, in around January of uh, 86. And we ended up in Clive Davis's offices at Arista maybe four months later, signing a, a big record deal. Uh, so I, I was 19. And um, we ended up getting Jim Dickinson to produce what was going to be our album. So we were the band... Um, he, he did the replacements, pleased to meet me at, at Arden in Memphis. Um, and then a band called green on red. And then he did us. And so we did our demos in, in the summer of, um, 1987. I think there, there's so much red tape in the major label world that it just took forever for this thing to get rolling. Yeah. And, uh, so we did our demos in Sam Phillips and, you know, fast forward, 30 years or something and i'm back there and it it looked exactly the same like they hadn't done anything to it it's i they kept it up you know it it, it looked yeah. great but it, you could have told me it was 1987 and i would have believed it, it it's it, it was almost like being in a time capsule it was really cool did that did, did that feel weird i mean had, had you hadn't really been back there since it sounds like um no i I went back a few years ago. My friend Bob Mayer, who wrote that great replacements book, he uh, yeah uh, he he and I spent a day together in Memphis, and 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 he got me in there, and and uh, I checked it out again. But other than that, it was it was the first time, and um, it, it was really fun because I felt like I felt kind of proud of myself because when I was last there, you know, I was a kid, and it was my first time ever really doing and doing anything of that magnitude, and even though that record got got scrapped we got like halfway into it and it just kind of wasn't happening um so it never came out but i just felt like oh man you know i actually did some stuff that i hoped i would do in these last in these last 30 years and so it was fun it it was a good feeling what so so what was was jim dickinson somebody that the label paired you guys with or was that somebody that you wanted to work with i mean even at that point he would have done You'd already mentioned, you know, the replacements and stuff, and and green on red. I, I I'm a big fan of green on red. Um, oh yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, so he had done stuff, and obviously, you know, even farther back with like Big Star and things like that. Did you were you a fan, or or how did that work? Well, um, we had the same management company that that managed the replacements at that point. So, um, uh, Russ and Gary, and they they had good things to say about Jim and. You know, Arista was a, was like a, you know, a middle of the road major label. So sure. they weren't going to go with, with anything too weird. And so um, he was kind of the guy that made sense. Like this guy's weird enough for what the band is into, but he knows how to make records. So um, I was probably too young to, to really know that much about him. Um, the thing that got, got us excited was this photo that 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 he gave us of uh of him and keith richards and you know he would tell the story of playing piano on um on wild horses if you if you watch the um 
movie Gimme Shelter, there's the great footage of them in Muscle Shoals and right. Jim sitting ne- sitting next to Keith and they're listening to the playback of Wild Horses. And um, so that's what it impressed me. Um, and he was great. He was super cool. And he was very up, up on the on, current music and i was always reading these these magazines like i i, I would read this it was this magazine that came out in the late 80s called rip r.i.p and it was it was primarily a metal magazine and i've never been a metal guy but they they would have articles on on punk bands like the descendants or bad brains and things and so i'd be reading these magazines and um we were um talking about something and uh Somehow the, the, the song um, Low Rider by, by the band War came up. And out of nowhere, Jim Dickinson goes, oh, you know, JFA covers that. <laughs> I was like, how the fuck do you know about Jody Foster's Army, this really obscure skate rock band from, from Phoenix, of all places? And uh, yeah, and he just knew this stuff. I'm sure some of it was from his, his son, Luther. Uh, but uh I was so impressed that, that, that he knew about these things. Uh, and uh, he was great. He was a super cool guy. I, and uh, he was kind of second guessing what the label wanted because it was a, you know, it, it was, it had to be a fairly slick record, he, even though we were like a roots rock band. He, 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 or maybe he kind of over guessed that it needed to be a little more slick than, than, than it had to be. And eventually we just kind of, agreed that yeah this isn't isn't really working so yeah a yeah. great a great loss for us I, I i hoped we would have kept going with him but uh we didn't so and the, so did it was, as, was it at that point that the label moved things over to to new york when you worked with steve jordan at the hit factory we were off the label by then um, oh, okay we, so so it was like a real classic like band gets signed the label never puts the record out the band is eventually no longer on the label kind of thing yes yeah Yeah, and um yeah but on the positive there's no way we didn't owe them at least a quarter of a million dollars so they just (laughs) they they, they let that slide and uh yeah that's a win (laughs) that's a win (laughs) yeah yeah so we ended up you know just kind of floating around and by, by now we changed the name to the carnies and um we ended up finding this woman uh who worked for a a publishing company and so she signed us to a publishing deal so we're talking like 89 and she said i got this guy who i think would really um you know you guys would benefit from working with and it, it was steve jordan and uh steve had just they just finished the the uh talk is cheap tour the keith richards uh solo tour and uh and it was right after he played with neil young on that just astounding snl appearance where they do rocking in the free world oh man and uh yeah one of neil's best televised performances for sure yes yeah so this would have been i mean i feel like this was like a month later and and i i as far as I know, I used the drum kit that, that Steve used that night. A- and uh, we went to the Hit Factory, this great old studio in Times Square. And um, uh, this guy, Nico Bolas, was the engineer. And he, he was the engineer for Freedom, the current Neil Young record at the time. And uh, it was just the greatest. Uh, Steve, you know, one of the greatest drummers of, of all time. And, and uh, I just learned more in that whatever that was seven day period about music and i've ever learned about anything and he he never showed me how to do anything he just kind of soaked up whatever it was that he had and um it just made me a hundred times better drummer It, it, it was such a weird thing because like i said he just really didn't ever say do this or do that it just kind of I don't know if that's if that's osmosis or not, but yeah, it, you were just you were just soaking up sort of the the what you were what you were seeing him do or sort of the way he approached things. Yeah. Yes. And uh, it was really funny. The uh, Nico Bolas, the engineer, he found out we were from North Carolina, and one, the, I think the, the first day we show up in the studio, and there are all there are these hay bales everywhere. <laughs> and and you know he just assumed oh these guys are from the country so let's get a bunch of hay bales from the um the barn where they 
where they keep all the police horses. I, I, I didn't know you could actually like buy hay bales from from this 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 police horse barn, but you could. And uh, and so he had these hay bales brought up. And uh, I think we we're a little offended at first. We also felt like, yeah, that's kind of funny. That is funny. <laughs> you were offended at first, and then you were like, "Well, I do feel more at home now. This is a little bit more our speed, you know the the hay." <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, it was such a wild week because it was the week the Berlin Wall came down, and um, so we were watching that the whole time on, on TV. And um, I got done m- my drumming, and Joe Strummer was playing that night at, at the Palladium which is where the that great cover shot of Paul Simon and smashing the bass on, on the cover of London calling the shot. And, uh, but you know, I had no money. I, I, I probably had $5. And, and I, and um, I said, Oh man, I'd love to go just see Joe Strummer. And, and Steve just reached into his pocket and pulled out a $20 bill, which was like, to me, that was a lot of money. And he goes, go. And so, so I, I took the 20 bucks and I just went downtown and I stood in line and Joe Strummer played, and to this day, it, I think it's still on like the top five concerts I've ever seen. It, it was better than The Clash. I saw The Clash on the Combat Rock tour, and this was somehow better. Yeah, just 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 a great night, just really amazing. That's so cool. So it seems to me like at this point, you're, you know, despite the fact that you don't have more than five dollars to your name, it sounds to me like you must have felt at least a little bit like. If if you in, even if you hadn't made it, you were in the process of making it, whatever that whatever that means. Or or how how did it feel? I mean, was that the way you were thinking at that point? Well, it, it's interesting when you talk about making it. Somehow, somehow, I gave myself in like probably when I was around fifteen or sixteen. Gosh, if I haven't made it by the time I'm twenty, I'm I don't know what I'm going to do. And I ended up signing this major label contract at nineteen. And so, like, I just thought, oh, wow, I kind of did do it, even though it went to complete shit after that. Right. But, but um, um, so I think by 1989, you know, this is this is three years later, I almost felt like a failure, like it was over at that point. You know, the, the huh. major label thing didn't work. Um, I have five dollars. And uh, um, I, I don't know what's what's ahead and um so it it was actually kind of a dark time for me personally and um i I didn't know what was next and and then um i ended up moving to chapel hill moving in with my brother uh in march of 1991 and um went on went on this what i can only describe as a death march tour the final gasp of of the carnies so this is um now we're in in i think september of 19 no um august of 91 and it's it's the three main guys from the carnies jeff myself and, and tim and our guitar player our guitar player is this guy named andy york and andy has uh went on to great success as the guitar player with John Mellencamp. I think he still might be. And he, he plays with Patti Smith also. Um, so we do this tour from, cha- from uh, first show was in Atlanta, you know, and it's, it's summer. So it's like super hot. Yeah. First shows Atlanta next show, Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like this horrific, hot, just endless drive. Yeah. And, and we get to, uh, we're finally pulling into Lubbock and like no one plays in Lubbock. And so we pull in and, um, the, the promoter meets us, you know, at, at the venue and the venue is a restaurant and, and he goes, <laughs> Guy, guys, the show's canceled because it's going to rain and you're playing on, on, on the patio. But great news. I can get you all in for free at the Dread Zeppelin show I'm promoting down the street. <laughs> and, and so I think we, ju- we just bought beer and a pizza. I don't think we thought to go to Buddy Holly's grave. But uh, yeah, and that was it. And, and then on to uh, <laughs> on to El Paso. 
Wow. Which was, it, it, it all sucked. A- anyway, so we, we end up going out to LA playing a, a couple showcase gigs. One was in SIR studio, the rehearsal place. And I was very excited because social distortion was rehearsing, uh, next door and that they were stars to me. Yeah. And so, um, and so, you know, we're just playing in this well lit room. Our, our manager is there and, uh, maybe three A and R people. And in the middle of a song, like three songs in one of the A and R women who was there to see us just gets up and, and walks out. Oh my God. <laughs> Full, fully lit, fully lit room. Yeah. I mean, it was like, I was impressed in a way. Oh my God. You really don't give a shit. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, so we play our way back and you know, Las Cruces opening for the same hair metal cover band we opened for in uh, El Paso. Whoa. And, and, uh, and then Fort Worth opening for a band that was like King's X. And we're like, by this point, we sound like the replacements. Please to meet me meets Exile on Main Street Stones. Yeah. So very ramshackle and, rock and roll. You know, yeah. Seat. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And by the end of it, I don't even think I had enough money to eat with the rest of the guys at the final meal that we had somewhere in Alabama. And and we get home and I load my drums into my car in Winston Salem and I drive home to Chapel Hill and I stopped where my brother worked and he goes, Hey, um, Mac from super chunk called. And I was just like, please be what I hope it is. Please. Yeah. And, yeah. and sure enough, he said that they were having, trouble with their drummer at the time and would i be interested and i was like oh yes so at so, that at, so at that point you just i mean what was the attraction of of a group like super chunk for you well i was you know my favorite bands during that whole period from 86 to um to then were i loved the replacements i loved Husker Du, i loved uh i loved the, the early rem stuff um so you know there was a lot of that in there and um uh i'd seen super chunk a couple times by that point uh maybe they were still called chunk one time i was i was filling in on drums for this band from raleigh called the accelerators who had a couple records out on uh, on profile records so this is around 19 maybe 90 or so and uh chunk opened for us at the cat's cradle i think it was the first time super chunk or chunk ever played the cat's cradle here in in chapel hill and i thought they were really good like they 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 uh you know had pop hooks and stuff and but was still kind of punk rock and then um basically max said you know this is in, in around september of 91 he goes we're going away on this trip opening for mud honey and we just kind of want to see if it's still going to work with our drummer or not but just in the in, in the event it doesn't work, would you would you listen to these these records? The first record and No Pocky for Kitty, which was the second record, which hadn't come out yet. And so I had a job as a window washer, and I would listen to these tapes while I washed windows all day in the hot in the hot sun. And uh, so uh, by the time they came back from the tour, I guess it just wasn't working. But I I, I did go to what was the final show with with chuck the original drummer and it, it was basically the local record release party for no Pocky for kitty so i think we're talking around um early to mid-september yeah of 91 and they were great like they were so good they were so much better than they they were the last time i'd seen them i think i'd also seen them open for urge overkill um maybe three months before that but they were just really great now. They played great. They looked great. Laura had just gotten her, her hair cut. So she didn't have these dreadlocks, but she looked like this elf. She looked amazing. Yeah. Her hair was really short. It was like this punk rock elf. And um, and she was smoking too, which was just such an incredible look. Uh, so it's it's um, messed it's messed up because they, they tell you, you know, when I was growing up, they kept saying smoking doesn't make you look cool. And I know it's bad for you and that you shouldn't do it, yeah. but but that is a lie. You do look cool when you're smoking. There's no way around Espe- it. Yeah, especially like a a, a female elf smoking. Yeah, it's, <laughs> a yeah, punk you, rock you can't, elf. You can't, you can't beat that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it must have been a few days later that um, 
Matt called me and I ended up going over to his house and we pulled this, pulled the furniture away and I set up my drums and the, uh, Jim and Laura showed up and we were playing Slack motherfucker within a couple minutes. And, and, uh, at that point it was, it was on. And I, I feel like, uh, my first show with the band would have been somewhere in mid October. And my, my, my first show, uh, on a tour was October 30th, the day before my birthday of 1991. And it rolled from, from then on. Wow. That's, that's crazy to think that it's been this year. It'll be like, you know, 30 years of being in that band. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's funny. People say, people say, God, it just seems like yesterday. And in a way it does, but it does seem like 30 years. Like it, it, when I think about all the touring and, you know, 30 years of just being somewhere different every day yeah. on the planet. Right. It's uh, it's not a normal existence. And um, um, so in a way, it seems like yesterday. In a way, it seems like 10 lifetimes ago. Yeah, yeah. So when you're talking about calls that it was a thrill to get, obviously, you know, a call from Mac saying that maybe Super Chunk was something that might be in your future. That must have been great. But have to imagine... You've already cited, you know, Husker Du is like the top of the list for you, one of the one of the tops of the list. So so it must have been pretty intense to get a call from Bob Mould asking, you know, for you to come out and work with him and his his group. That was uh that was what was it 2000 uh er, kind of early 2010s is that about when that started? I think that was that's an interesting story that I'll I'll try to make as succinct as, as I can. Uh, I was um on tour with the Mountain Goats. So th- this would have been I think um, I feel like it was like the very early spring of '09, I think. And, and um, we were we're just finishing up a tour on the East Coast, and we were playing um, um, somewhere. It wasn't Philly yet. It was a show before Philly, somewhere in that area. And um, and Jason Narducci. Uh, who's who had been the bass player for Bob uh, called and Jason and I played together in the Robert Pollard band um, in 2006, I think, uh, for, for about nine months, which was a, a great experience also. And uh, so J- by this point, Jason's playing with Bob Mould and he calls and says, hey, you know, we're on tour right now. We're having a problem with this drummer, all these drummer problems. Right. <laughs> and. and uh, would you be willing to do this European tour that we've got coming up? And I didn't have anything for that stretch of time. I think it was going to be like May, June of, of, uh, Oh nine. And so I said, yeah. And so now I think it's the next day. And, uh, and we're, we're in Philly at that first Unitarian church and we're playing. And I got another call from Jason and he goes, would you be willing to finish this tour with us? Like (laughs) of America. (laughs) And, uh, they still had um, at least a week to go, uh, maybe a week and a half uh, on the West Coast. And by chance, this Mountain Ghost tour of Australia had gotten canceled that day. Um, so I said, you know, I have the time and I'm feeling lucky. Let's do it. And, and so um, I just said, give me a list of whatever songs I I need to know. Uh, I knew a lot of the Who's Could Do stuff just because I was such a fan. I, I knew um several of the sugar hits i I knew you know several of the solo hits so so i i i did know a lot of the material i had never played any of it right but um so so we have one more show uh in dc so we play in dc and then by this point i didn't really have a home here in uh in chapel hill i was still kind of living in brooklyn i I lived there for a couple years from around 08 to, to to 10 and um so I was staying at my parents' place, and so the, the guys in the mountain goats dropped me off. My parents. I think I took a shower. I don't know if I spent the night or not, but the, I, I went to the airport not long after that and flew out to uh, L.A. Learned whatever I needed to learn on on the plane, you know, on my headphones, and um, stayed stayed the night in L.A. We drove to Solano Beach outside of San Diego the next day, sound checked, and played that night. That's nuts. It was crazy. I mean, it, it, so 
So when you ask if I was nervous to get that call, there wasn't time to be. It was just sink sure. or swim, sure. you know? Um, sure. And, and I don't think we rehearsed all the songs at Soundcheck. So there were a bunch of songs that were just kind of, we were just playing that night for the first time. And B Bob does this thing that Chuck Berry does that y you stop when, <laughs> when that right foot comes down. And, yeah. uh, and that, that's when I knew the end was coming. <laughs> so, so when that, I mean, how, how I'm, I'm trying to figure out a good way to phrase this into a question. I don't feel like I'm, I'm still sort of like trying to put myself in, in the position that you would find yourself in where you're, you're learning songs on a plane and you're, and you're showing up. I mean, does that require just a certain amount of, obviously there's a certain kind of like earned confidence right you've played shows so you know the way to play shows and you know how to play rock music or whatever you know but i'm also just curious about the sort of willingness that you have to just dive into a thing um have you always have you always been pretty kind of head first in that way yeah i, I always feel like if the opportunity comes up you have to do it and a, a good example of that is um God, when was this? this? Might have been four years ago, maybe. I, I was um, Fred Armisen and Bill Hader asked me if I would be in this episode of Documentary Now, where um, uh, basically it was this incredible episode they did, where they they did a spoof of Stop Making Sense, the Talking Heads film. Yeah, it's great. Um, and it's like it's like down to the minute detail i actually asked uh, so anyway they, they wanted me to be to be the drummer in this and i actually asked chris france from talking heads like well, exactly what the drums were that he played so we, we got as close as we could to those drums and so it looked really perfect um and uh so it was so much fun and we rehearsed and everyone was really funny and great and so we went into the valley uh to film this thing you do two two sets you know you film it twice they bring in an audience some old cool old old cool theater and um john mulaney was the mc and he was great and so in between sets um hal wilner hal wilner the legendary uh, music supervisor producer uh uh had a role in this thing it didn't make it into the final cut unfortunately where he kind of plays this john sinclair abby hoffman kind of rabble rouser dude and yeah. he's really great and so he comes up to me and goes hey what are you doing tomorrow and i said well i'm, I'm flying home to north carolina and he goes well, would you stay an extra day and, and i said what's up and, and I, I hadn't met him until that day and he said i'm producing this recording session out out at um uh village recorder which is where they did all all the great steely dan records and things like that out in santa monica and i said who who's who who are the artists and he goes well it's 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 going to be three artists we're just doing each artist is doing a a, a t-rex cover um so it's going to be nick cave uh maria mckee from lone justice and, and courtney love and i was like Oh, I got to do this. Yeah. yeah. And, right. and like, and, and so I said, what are the songs? And I still got the, the piece of notebook paper where I wrote down the name of the songs. And, um, so he goes, uh, all right, I'll, I'll have my, my assistant call you later with all the details. So all the while we're shooting this second run through of this entire show, I'm just thinking, all right, I got to keep the car for an extra day. I got to figure out where I right. can stay. <laughs> I got to learn, uh, download and learn these songs. And then I got, you know, just like, just come. I, I was lucky that these songs were now, were now in the muscle memory. So I was just playing, um, uh, the documentary now songs. And so the next day drive over to Santa Monica and, and, um, and we did this thing. It was, it was amazing. Courtney Love didn't show up, which was probably for the best, but, uh, but, um, you but know, you just kind of, yeah, but you've got the 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 compilation came out last last year, uh, pos, pos, yes. posthumously. Uh, you yes, know, Hal passed away unfortunately. Yeah. What a, what a what an inspiration yeah. that guy is. Um, oh my god, he was great. Yeah, and, and, and so, but that's an example of just like, oh, I got to do this just to do it. You know, I and it and it was it was it was life changing. It was a very life changing experience. Uh, uh, you know, he. It, it, it was the first, maybe only time I've ever 
been like in a studio and the artist walks in and it's like almost like an Elvis moment. Like, oh my God, that's, that's him. Yeah. Those are, those are the pants he wears. Like those are those kind of cool, you know, uh, hand sewn, almost bell bottoms that you see in these pictures and it's him. And, and he was great. I mean, it was like, I just couldn't believe I was in the same room as that voice. Yeah. I mean, what an insane and incredible, an incredible moment, but it, it comes down to that willingness, right? That willingness to dive into something that, you know, yeah. if, if, if you think too much about it, I can only imagine, you know, you end up sort of thinking yourself out of the thing. You know what I mean? If, if you were, you totally. know, so you sort of have to just dive in. It's funny, I had written a question down that I guess would go back to around that same period we were talking about the Bob Mould, you know, when you first started working with, with Bob, but but you you play on a on a VMA's performance, right, of, of <laughs> Katy Perry and Joe Perry. Uh, Steve maybe wasn't available that day or whatever, but um, we will rock you, right? Uh, and what I was going to ask you was when you're doing something like that, you know, does it feel surreal for you when it's happening or are you sort of focused on I got to do my job while I'm up here? You know, what, what, what is it? What does it feel like? It's both. And th th that was an interesting scenario because basically I, I wasn't a featured member of this, of this thing. Basically my, uh, a guy I knew called a couple of days before this thing and said, Hey, I need to put together a drum section right. to play. We will rock you with Katy Perry at, at, uh, Radio City for the for the VMAs, and I was just like, "Oh, this could be the greatest story I'll ever get to tell. I, I have to do it." <laughs> so, so, uh, and um, so you know, the the next day or a day and a half later, I'm in this rehearsal space, uh, tiny space with Joe Perry, Katy Perry, and these other guys, and uh, it was just nuts. I mean, it, like you, those are the moments you kind of live for. Like that's. That's kind of why I do it at this point, just just to see what what almost ridiculous scenarios I can end up in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, but um, that that whole weekend was really interesting because, um, you know, you're like I said, I, I wasn't a featured player. I, I I was, you know, you can barely see me on stage during the footage of it. But I saw all these amazing people. Like at one point before we were about to to go on. Um, I look to my left and this very small woman walks by and I realize, oh my God, it's Madonna. And, and it, it was, it was, uh, the year Michael Jackson died. Ah. So the way this thing began was Madonna comes up and it's very dramatic. And she does this, um, not a eulogy, but she talks about Michael and, uh, but it was the most incredible moment where basically the, the musicians for the We Will Rock You thing, we were submerged. The stage at Radio City goes down and, and then it comes up like it, it's on springs or something and you know, for dramatic effects. So we, we were kind of below the stage. And so she walks by and, and there was a moment where I'm just looking at her. She's on top of these stairs about to make her entrance you know, for in front of the entire world. And I'm just watching her and she's in complete silence in the shadows. And I'm just thinking, this is the weirdest moment of my life. I'm, I'm 10 feet away from Madonna, just watching her prepare herself to go do this thing that would just be terrifying to do. But right. like she's cut from this, she's cut from this cloth that allows her to go do that. You know, it's, it's, do you feel like it's you something else? Do you feel like you know somebody who, you know, I was going to ask you if it's if it's weird being on TV or or, or have you gotten sort of used to it? Well, it's it's real unnatural, you know. Being on stage is unnatural. Being in front of people is really unnatural. I I, I think, but you just kind of, I guess you just kind of get used to it, and you realize that's what goes with it. But but like when, like um, I've gotten to play in the the late night with seth meyer's band the uh 8g band yeah. a few times they'll have have drummers come and play for the week and it's so much fun it's really great everyone's amazing and um but you're on camera a lot because you're kind of the featured player you know this the shot kind of starts on you right and it's kind of weird the first day and then you just kind of get used to it and then you kind of maybe you kind of play it up a little bit too so i i think 
eventually you kind of have fun with it. And I think if, if you don't, if you don't learn to have fun with it, then it, it can probably get to be a, a weird thing where I don't want to do this anymore. It's too unnatural. Sure. You, you know, know you, you talk about seeing somebody like Madonna or, or being in the same room as Nick Cave. And, and, and it sounds to me like, you know, for, for a really long time, I worked uh, at a record store and I would specifically be involved in like in-store performances or, or on-site autograph signings and things like that. And this weird thing happens, right, where you certainly do start to understand that, that 95% of the people that you interact with in something like that, you know, they're people doing their jobs, basically, right? You know, like the bass player in the band is just a guy doing a job, even if they're a very successful or very well-known band, you know? Yeah. Um, but then there are those certain people where you recognize that there's like a, a, a separate quality, like an extra quality to, ev to people every now and then. And it sounds to me like you still find yourself in positions where that sort of thing happens, where even though there's a certain amount of just like everybody's here to get this thing done and to make sure that this project works well and to make sure that they're kind of hitting their marks or whatever, you still have those moments where you're a little starstruck. Are they, are they rarer for you now? Yeah, I think, like you just said, I realize that everyone's kind of just kind of doing their job and, and uh, everyone's got, you know, especially showbiz people, everyone has massive problems. <laughs> you know, there, there's a great, there's a great Bono quote where he says something like, anyone who has the need to be like a singer in a band in front of a th of thousands of people has something really wrong with them. Yeah. And it's the, like, not in a bad way, but, but it, it does, there's something going on there. I, I, I think that's true. And I, I certainly have my, <laughs> my problems, but, uh, um, it's funny. I, I, I'm not, I, I'm a weird ageist. Like I am not nervous around people who are younger than me. Mm. And like an exa example is Joe's band called the Hooters. We mention them on the best show often. As a matter of um, fact, I listened to an interview you did with, I believe, the yes. drummer from the Hooters in order to get ready for yes. this one. So yeah, yeah. Well, so I, I, I'm I'm happy you heard that because I was really nervous talking to him because he he he's one of the first drummers I saw in person who really impressed me, and so right, um, you know, and he's older than me, so. So, so he must have, uh, you know, s sacred knowledge I don't have. Sure. <laughs> so, so I just assume everyone who's older than me, ha you know, is better than me or, or has something. Whereas like Foo Fighters, I, I'm not nervous around them because they're younger than me, except for Pat. I'm nervous around him <laughs> because he was in the germs too. So right. I have this, this weird thing where if someone's older than me, and you know, successful. It, no matter if he's in the germs or the hooters, you know, I'm nervous. That, <laughs> that I love. We we finally achieved a long-standing aim of mine, which was to have somebody mention the germs and the hooters in the same right? sentence yes. on this podcast. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for thank uh -huh. you for that. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, well, before <laughs> before we wrap up, uh, and it's been so much fun talking with you. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about about the best show. Um, uh, because I'm a huge, huge fan and, uh, you know, I, I listened sometimes when it was on FMU, but I didn't really become, um, obsessed with it until it launched on the, on the website and as its own standalone thing. But something that I've really, really enjoyed is, uh, especially since the show came back from sort of a 2020 hiatus, the best show is like PG thirteen rated at its at its filthiest. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> right, yes. Except when AP Mike got gets to do like solo things every now and then, then he'll push it real far. But um, I've noticed that you're working uh, in your calls as close to blue as the best show gets lately, um, and I've wondered if that has been uh, a lot of fun for you. Yeah, that was always the. Um that was all, always the thing for, for, you know, for the longest time was how close to like saying something without, without saying it, can we get, and, um, right. You know, the, the, the best examples were instead of cock, we'd say, but we'd, we'd say 
pad faucet. Uh, <laughs> Which is or absolutely, something like that. it's much funnier. It's much funnier. Yeah, yeah. They're always funnier than the real word. A- and so, but somewhere in the last maybe two months, maybe three months, we agreed that I could say like an actual one of the seven words in in, in a call. And right. so the 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 joke became me never telling him where it was going to be in the call. Right. And so it, it usually came late in the call where he's just kind of probably forgotten about it. Like, oh, he's probably not going to curse. And that and then there'd be the one curse. And but I <laughs> my thought was to do it maybe five times and not again. And so I think we did it about five times. And if you notice, I don't think there's been a curse word in the last four or five calls. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I guess now so, that now that you mention it. I mean, it's it's so it's you guys have been doing that show for a very long time and you're 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 um you know, reading reading it never in the Sharpling's book. I mean, there's it's clear that there's like just such this you guys have this kind of relationship and and this friendship that really fuels the the comedy. Um but it, it but it, it it must be when you have a collaboration that that's that's that is that long lasting that there's got to be ways to sort of like you mentioned with the mountain goats kind of like try something slightly different you know so is, i mean it sounds like maybe it was born out of that a little bit the let's let's take things someplace that we haven't gone yet you know oh totally yeah and and and, and we'll work in things uh that will appear frequently for maybe three calls and then never again R- like right. uh like uh i some <laughs> I don't know if I heard someone say this or I said it. I said, uh, like in a conversation with someone, well, my landlord says, <laughs> and I just thought that's the, that's the dumbest thing I think I've ever heard or said. Yeah. So that became a recurring thing in about five weeks of calls where, well, you know, my landlord says, right. And, 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 and then it's gone. It's, it's never done again. <laughs> um, so there's always things like that. And, and for the longest time we would do, you know, I'll, I'll write up the script and send it to him and for a long time i would do like a not a full script for him because he he likes to be surprised by things so it'll basically say you know tom's cue line is this and then you know then it'll get to this kind of riffing thing yeah and you know we have it written in the script riff and so but then for 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 almost a year or so i think i was sending full scripts Mm. and and that got to be a little, maybe, n- not as much fun. Uh, and and so now for the, about the last four months or so, we're back to that old way of doing it, where there's a lot of, a lot of surprises in it for him. And, and I could tell that he, I can t- I can I can hear him laughing a lot. Uh, you know, kind of off mic now. So that that gives me great great pleasure when I surprise him with something that that he wasn't expecting. And 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 he does it with me too. Like basically, we'll a lot of the recent calls will will feature me doing a list of of like 20 to 30 whatever dumb product names tv shows movies fake all bands. the dumb exist. yeah right yeah all all fake and then i'll tell him come up with 20 of the dumbest same thing yeah. names you can think of but don't tell me so it's it's we're hearing these things for the first time as as we're performing it so that that kind of brings back a lot of the the old uh, whatever tight tightrope walking yeah. uh, you know f- feel of of how we used to do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you haven't been able to be out on the road lately because there hasn't been live music or tours. Um, you know, luckily things are starting to seem like they're going to happen again. But but you know, typically, would you often call the best show while you were out on tour? Oh yeah, all the time. Uh, especially in the um, the late '90s. God, up until up until you know, probably oh oh seven or eight or so. Uh, longer than that, yeah. I, I mean, I, I was. I can't tell you how many times I was in a parking lot behind a club or a McDonald's. Yeah, you know, reading from these. You know the scrawl I did in the van that day. Um, <laughs> there was a there's a, a great moment where um, the Mountain Goats were playing at uh, Webster Hall in New York, 
and we, we had this quick call plan because it was close to showtime uh stage time for the mountain goats and, and um amy mann was in the studio with tom in uh new jersey and uh i called in as a guy named 80s rick and and, <laughs> and 80s rick uh only wanted to know when till tuesday was getting back together <laughs> and, and uh and, and so we're doing this call and i'm doing the call from um the bathroom right next to the stage at uh webster hall so there's like all oh, this cough the opening bands playing in the background and my character started screaming for some reason i can't remember what the what the bit was but i was i was very upset and i was screaming and john derniel just happened to be walking by the bathroom at that point hears me screaming and it just starts pounding on the door are you okay are you okay <laughs> and so I had to open the door and tell him what was happening so there were a lot of moments like that a lot there were a lot of nights where just you know trying to find a quiet space to do it and you know i, I have, I have a, a vivid memory of doing a call as uh, some now forgotten republican oh joe the plumber was his name it was it was this guy who was like a oh yeah normal yeah remember him so yeah, just what a... election would that have been <laughs> Was that been Bush, uh, Bush Kerry, maybe? Was that the election? No. Uh, I think it was. Was, I was think, it Obama by that point? I think it was Obama McCain. Must have been, yeah. So I called in a, as him from the parking lot across from the Wonder Ballroom in uh, Portland. And I remember, same thing, where I had to like raise my voice and yell. And just people walking by, <laughs> seeing this guy in a parking lot, just yelling, what the hell is wrong with this guy? So, you know, you, you have to sacrifice a lot of dignity if you're doing these calls, you know, from these bizarre locations. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, I love that. It's the, the show is, is such a, is such a, um, a source of joy for me. And I always, I always love I always love your calls. Uh, I, I I look forward to that. You know, pretty much pretty much every week. And uh, and man, it's been really really great getting to talk with you about about everything. I feel like we could probably I could probably ask you three hours worth of questions. You know, to continue things on. Uh, we didn't even get into so much, but that's okay. Maybe we could have you back at some point in the future. I'd love to come back. It was very very much fun. All right. Well, John, thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, uh, we'll speak again sometime. That sounds great. Thanks. So. Um, hope to see, hope to see you in Phoenix sometime. Stick right reflective tape to the collar of your shirt. Mind your business and you won't get hurt. Be true to the things you said you'd be true to. Always keep your objective in view. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Jason Woodbury. I write, host, and produce transmissions. Our audio is edited by Andrew Horton. Let's do a special shout-out to Andrew Horton. Check out his great label, Good Glass Records, over on Bandcamp. Andrew is one of the best. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate your work on the show. Of course, we also appreciate the work of Sarah Goldstein and Jonathan Mark Walls, who both contribute visual elements to the show. And uh, ultimate gratitude to Just Engage, Aquarium Drunkard founder and producer of Transmissions, our executive producer. Thanks so much, Justin. Thanks so much to the Transmissions team. They are all the best. If you want to help us keep making Transmissions, there are a couple things you can do. Number one is just share word of the show. If, if you hear a conversation like this one with John Worcester, or if you, you like my conversation with Jim Jarmish or Sarah Louise, or Margot Price, Nels Klein, whoever, just uh, take a minute to share it. Put it up on Twitter. Put it out on Instagram. I guess maybe some people are still using Facebook. It seems sort of like a wasteland to me. But you know what? Wherever you got people paying attention, please post it up there and let people know that you enjoy what we're doing. We're an independently produced podcast. We're doing this all on our own. So we count on you all. And word of mouth is really key to what we're doing. You can take things a step further and rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts. That helps out too. And of course... If you really want to help us out, you can head over to the Patreon page, look up Aquarium Drunkard on Patreon, 
toss a couple bucks a month our way. That's a great way to help the servers keep humming and help us keep making this independent interview showcase, which we bring you every Wednesday absolutely free. So that's a couple ways you can support transmissions. Uh, you can also, if, if, if none of that is within reach, totally get it. Uh, maybe just shoot a quick email over. Let, let me know what you like about the show, what you'd like to hear more of. If you have specific guest requests, uh, I'm, I'm definitely down. You can find my email address over at AquariumDrunkard.com, where you'll also find 16 years worth of incredible audio, video, music, mixtapes, features, essays, all sorts of stuff. Aquarium Drunkard, I was a fan of AD long before I ever started working with AD, and it's really an honor to be uh, contributing to this great thing. Next week on the show, a conversation about record store life uh, and just regular life with Bela Co. Compretcher. His new book is called Love, Death, and Photosynthesis. It's out on Don Giovanni Records. I tore through this book like you wouldn't believe. What a beautiful, funny, sad, and heartbreaking memoir. Absolutely incredible. Great music writing, but beyond that, just great writing. So I hope you will check that out and come back next week. Every Wednesday, we drop a new show for you. So stay safe until then. Thanks for listening. I'll speak with you more soon. This is Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions. Keep two working contacts among your effects. See the tall poppies with their tender, fragile necks. Solomon in all his glory, not arrayed like these. Bending in the wind like pilgrims on their knees. Those who came to learn these lessons left no trace of their presence. Have a flashlight just in case Show the world your true